Welcome, everyone. On behalf of the Collegium Institute, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today for this for our public engagement lecture, Living the Truth on the Relevance of Elizabeth Anscombe's Thought Today. Uh, if anyone would like to receive announcements about other special events or regular programs presented by the Collegium Institute, please do add yourself to a sign-up sheet which uh, may or may not be circulating at some point. Um, also, if you're looking for a seat, uh, there's sort of a semi-hidden row back here. There's another bench back there. There are some seats which are um, also serving as luggage racks. And there's also a, uh, we're, we're in a cafe, uh, I understand. So there's also a countertop back there uh, if you need to recline. So there are, there are some seats, but we're really pleased uh, with, with the turnout today. Uh, as many of you may know, today's event is part of a robust programming initiative made possible by a new partnership among the University of Pennsylvania Libraries, the Department of Philosophy, and the Program for Research on Religion and Urban Civil Society, PRUX, which is centered upon the installation of the Collegium Institute Anscombe Archive at Penn. Gertrude Elizabeth Margaret Anscombe, Elizabeth, is widely known as one of the most influential moral philosophers in the Anglo-analytic tradition of the 20th century and heralded by some as the most influential woman philosopher that we know of. She was professor of philosophy at Cambridge University and a principal literary executor of Ludwig Wittgenstein. Before Cambridge, she, together with celebrated philosophers Philippa Foote, Iris Murdoch, and Mary Midgley, was a core member of what recent scholars have called a female school of analytic philosophy, which transformed moral philosophy in wartime Oxford, culminating with Anscombe's most famous essay, Modern Moral Philosophy, wherein she coined the term consequentialism. In America, Anscombe was appointed an adjunct professor of philosophy here at the University of Pennsylvania from 1968 to 1980. She was also a prominent Catholic public intellectual, and the Anscombe archive was acquired by the Collegium Institute, which then transferred it to the Penn Library's Kislak Center for Special Collections, where it will be housed and studied through June 2022. The Collegium Institute Anscombe Archive at the University of Pennsylvania consists of over 600 cataloged items, including unpublished manuscripts in various stages of revision, personal correspondence with major philosophical figures and journals, and philosophical offprints with substantial marginalia, all put together in 21 archival boxes. It is expected to become a nexus for new academic networks and learning opportunities on and off campus, including four annual conferences based on Anscombe's work, other special events and seminars, and the appointment of undergraduate, graduate, and faculty fellowships. Beginning their terms next fall will be two new Prox Fellows, Dr. Janice Chi and Dr. John Peter Diulio, who were recently appointed as the John and Daria Berry Foundation Fellow and James N. Perry Scholar of Philosophy, Politics, and Society, respectively, and who will be devoted largely to scholarship on the archive. So look out for them next fall. The first of the four annual international conferences begins tomorrow, if you were looking for something to do. It's the Anscombe Archive Conference on Mind and Action. Preceding it is our public engagement lecture right now, featuring, featuring Professor Jennifer Frey, whom it is my honor now to introduce. Dr. Jennifer Frey is assistant professor in the philosophy department at the University of South Carolina. Before that, and after completing her PhD at the University of Pittsburgh, she was collegiate assistant professor of humanities at the University of Chicago, where she was also a member of the prestigious Society of Fellows in the liberal, in the liberal arts and an affiliated faculty member in the philosophy department. 
Her research lies at the intersection of the philosophy of action, ethics, and meta-ethics. But despite the technical sound of meta-ethics, Professor Frey has always sought to engage the larger questions relevant to all thinking people inside the university and out. And she has sought to do so successfully. She recently completed her term as co-principal investigator with Professor Candace Vogler at the University of Chicago of a major three-year, multi-million dollar cha-ching research project <laughs> on virtue, happiness, and the meaning of life, out of which bloomed her co-edited book, Self-Transcendence and Virtue. She also writes for the Virtue blog and hosts a popular philosophy and literary podcast called Sacred and Profane Love, Philosophy Outside Academia. Besides specializing on Anscombe, she also works on a couple other A's, as she puts it, Aristotle and Aquinas. And despite her better judgment, as she also puts it, she can't resist Kant. But today, she'll be speaking to us on the relevance of Anscombe's thought today. So please join me in welcoming Professor Jennifer Frey. Um, can everybody hear me? Fine? Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thanks to the Collegium Institute for inviting me. And I'm really thrilled to see so many people here for a lecture on Elizabeth Anscombe. Um, you stole my thunder just slightly <laughs> in that I'm going to repeat some of the things that you were just told about Anscombe, and I'm going to tell you a little bit um, about who she was. So as was just mentioned, Elizabeth Anscombe is widely recognized as one of the most significant women philosophers of the 20th century and one of the most significant analytic philosophers, period. So this afternoon, I want to say a few things about who she was uh, and what her major con contributions to philosophy are. But I want to have a particular focus on the concept of practical truth, a concept that um, contemporary theorists ignore, um, but that she herself uh, tried to revitalize along with the concept of practical knowledge. Now, although Anscombe is an intriguing character in her own right, there are many legendary stories that circulate about her. My reasons for going into her personal biography are ultimately philosophical. I believe that we see in her own life, in an especially illuminating way, the concept referred to in my title, that of a specifically practical form of truth, a truth that is exemplified not in having true propositions, but in a well-lived human life. Anscombe lived in search of and fidelity to the truth, and her will was habitually conformed to it. Such a person is such as to live well, and I think that Anscombe did. So Anscombe was born on March 18, 1919, in Limerick, Ireland, where her father, then a British Army officer, was stationed. And that means that this March, we marked her centenary. It's been 100 years since her birth. In 1937, she entered Oxford University, where she read Mods and Greats at St. Hugh's College. Although she was raised in a religiously indifferent home, she had decided to convert to Roman Catholicism in high school. During her first year at Oxford, she was formally received into the Catholic Church by a Dominican priest. This places her in the venerable tradition of those who studied their way into the Catholic faith out of a deep and abiding commitment to the truth rather than custom or habit. When her daughter, Mary Geach, asked her why she converted to Catholicism, she replied quite simply that she believed the teachings of Christ including most especially his teaching that the bread and wine at the Last Supper had become his body and blood. When her parents took her to an Anglican priest in the hope that he would talk some sense into their daughter, she confronted him about whether what he called the body of Christ was still bread. After this encounter, the priest wrote to her parents advising them to let her convert 
as he had never encountered anyone so convinced of the truth of transubstantiation. This is when she's in high school. In 1938, Anscombe met another philosopher and convert, Peter Geach, at a Corpus Christi procession at Blackfriars Hall at Oxford. They married in 1941 after she graduated. The following year, she was awarded a research fellowship at Newnham College, Cambridge, where she stayed until 1945. It was during this time that she met Ludwig Wittgenstein and attended his lectures. She was subsequently elected to a fellowship at Somerville College in Oxford. At time, that was the Women's College at Oxford, and she remained there until 1970. Despite being appointed at Oxford, Anscombe made weekly trips back to Cambridge to meet with Wittgenstein, who became her close friend. Although Wittgenstein has been called a misogynist for his negative attitudes about women, he was deeply impressed by, admired, and trusted Elizabeth Anscombe, and he affectionately addressed her as old man. His trust in her own understanding of his thought was strong enough that he appointed her as one of his primary literary executors and translators, even though she did not know any German. Wittgenstein arranged for her to go to Vienna to learn so that she could translate his work. Her translation of his philosophical investigations has become a modern classic. This achievement alone would have secured her place in 20th century thought, but she would go on to make significant philosophical contributions in her own right. In 1970, Anscombe was appointed to the chair Wittgenstein had occupied at Cambridge University, a position she held until her retirement from teaching in 1986. She also had visiting appointments all over the world, including here at the University of Pennsylvania, where she and Peter Geach were adjunct professors from 1968 until 1980. Anscombe's philosophical accomplishments are too impressive to list in detail. But suffice it to say that the following is undeniable and widely recognized. She made considerable impact in all major areas of philosophy, ethics, action theory, philosophy of language and mind, and metaphysics. Her only monograph, Intention, has been described as the most important treatment of action since Aristotle, and one of the masterworks of 20th century philosophy in English. Her essay, Modern Moral Philosophy, is still widely acknowledged as one of the most influential essays in contemporary ethics, as it coined the term consequentialism and sparked a renewed interest in the long neglected concepts of virtue and human flourishing, and called for an Aristotelian approach to ethical thinking more generally. Although her method in philosophy is broadly Wittgensteinian, her intuitions lie firmly in the Aristotelian tradition. One reason I think contemporary philosophers struggle so much to interpret Anscombe properly is that they are ignorant of this tradition, especially the thought of the great medieval Aristotelian St. Thomas Aquinas, whose work clearly left deep imprints on Anscombe's mind. Curious conclusions about Anscombe's thought are drawn as a result of this ignorance. Anscombe's final lecture, so the final lecture that she gave, was titled Doing the Truth, and her final publication titled Practical Truth. There's something fitting about this, as Anscombe was a philosopher who stood out, and that she was not simply interested in knowing the truth, but living it. And she saw that there is a difference between these two ways of being related to reality. Anscombe's life was marked not only by a well-trained desire to know reality, but the will to conform herself and her actions to it, to put her whole person in fidelity to the truth. From a young age, she put her formidable intellect and considerable philosophical talents in the service of truth. She refused to make truth subservient to laudable practical goals or for her own gain, and she had little patience for those who evinced moral earnestness detached from the truth. This fidelity to the truth often placed her, with respect to her colleagues and her compatriots, contra mundum. In a radio address titled, Does Oxford Moral Philosophy Corrupt the Youth? Anscombe quipped that, if you want to corrupt people by direct propagation of ideas, moral earnestness is pretty well indispensable. 
Anscombe found such earnestness all around her, but she never lost hold of the truth that the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel and that moral earnestness must never be confused with moral seriousness. But she shrugged off the suggestion that England's great universities were the corrupting the youth when they attended them. The best British philosophers, she argued, are mirrors of the corruptions of British society at large. They do nothing more than reflect back to us our own failure to refuse various corruptions and degenerations of thought. Oxford philosophy, she contended, is conceived perfectly in the spirit of the time and might be called the philosophy of the flattery of that spirit. Chief among these degenerations of thought were the loss of recognition of absolute prohibitions, most especially the absolute prohibition against murder or killing the innocent. Although Anscombe lived a life devoted to philosophy, which she once described as thinking about the most difficult and ultimate questions, she was not withdrawn from practical affairs. And her obedience to the truth is manifest in her practical life in deep and obvious ways. In 1939, at the age of 20, Anscombe published a pamphlet protesting British rhetoric and policy leading up to its involvement in World War II with the title, The Justice of the Present War Examined. The pamphlet denounced both the government's aims and the means by which it was likely to pursue them. It predicted with stunning accuracy much of the grossly unjust behavior that the British government would eventually engage in during the war. But what Anscombe found most reprehensible was her government's popular rhetoric regarding the so-called indivisibility of modern warfare. According to this view, members of the civilian population are to be treated as enemy combatants such that direct and intentional attacks upon their life are justified. Acts of terror bombing, such as the bombing of Dresden, which killed tens of thousands of innocent civilians and leveled a city world renowned for its beauty and culture, were justified according to this policy. Seven years later, when she was a fellow at Somerville College at Oxford, Anscombe opposed Oxford's move to award President Harry S. Truman an honorary degree. Anscombe opposed this on the grounds that Truman, as the person who gave the orders to drop atomic bombs on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, was a mass murderer. Anscombe called Truman's acts murder because they were a calculated choice made by Truman to intentionally kill innocents indiscriminately for the sake of his further goals. Only three people supported her vote. This deeply scandalized Anscombe, but the shock moved her to do the hard work of articulating and attacking the false philosophical commitments that seemed to lie beneath her esteemed colleagues' approval of Truman's war crimes. The arguments for Truman's decision fall under what Anscombe termed consequentialism, the idea that if the consequences for one's actions bring about more good than evil, the act is not only permissible, but morally required. Anscombe attacked this view in her essay, Modern Moral Philosophy, which was published in 1958. She attacked it philosophically as resting on a problematic account of intention, but she also noted that the view is radically out of joint with Judeo-Christian ethics, which has as its animating core a doctrine of absolute moral prohibitions, including an absolute prohibition against murder. She saw that consequentialism presents a direct attack upon the principle articulated by St. Paul in his letter to the Romans, that we may never do evil, that good may come. Anscombe further notes that the denial of absolute prohibitions is related to a rather high-minded conception of responsibility. We are now answerable for the future and the total state of the world in an imposing and rather dramatic way, since we must always consider how we can bring about more good than evil on the whole. This means, of course, that it will be the morally right thing to do to incinerate innocent Japanese children, and that it may be morally right for a cardinal to deny Christ. 
so long as the welfare of the people might be improved by it. But at the same time that one is newly responsible for so much one has failed to do, one is also responsible for so little of what one did. For once we understand responsibility in terms of causal contributions to events, then we must recognize that agents are also subject to causal forces. And so we say that those who do wrong are victims of unjust social structures rather than agents whose choices and actions may be praised or blamed based on their essential nature or quality. That is, whether it was the right action performed for the right reasons and from a stable and lasting disposition of character. It was the point of intention to show that actions are constituted in their species by acts of reason and will, and that we are responsible, that is to say, subject to praise and blame and guilt and punishment, only for what we bring about through practical deliberation and choice, or for what we fail to bring about through correct deliberation and choice. So that would include negligence and omissions. What we do intentionally is what we know under descriptions that might have possibly figured in our practical deliberation. And what we are responsible for includes this, but further extends to what we could have and should have deliberated about when the circumstances called for it. The sphere of personal responsibility then is the sphere of what falls under our deliberative rational control, the sphere of our practical deliberation. Absolute prohibitions, Anscombe thought, functioned as first principles of right practical reasoning. They state what correct deliberation will never recommend on the grounds that they are acts that a just or good person would never perform, no matter what the circumstances. Consequentialism, by contrast, is a philosophy that understands human actors as responsible for all they bring about knowingly, which means that all that good practical deliberation could possibly consist in is the weighing up of potential good or bad consequences. And one of the main goals of modern moral philosophy was to establish these points. Although that essay is often credited with bringing about virtue ethics as a distinctive moral philosophy, we cannot help but notice that Anscombe called in that paper not for a different sort of moral theory, but for an end to moral theorizing altogether until we possessed an adequate philosophical psychology. One reason she had for saying this is that the sort of philosophical psychology that reigned at Oxford during her time there made considerations of justice, such as an absolute prohibition against murder, impossible to defend. Anscombe's commitment to living the truth certainly, certainly put her on the outs with the dons at Oxford and with the broader culture in Britain at large. And it made her the subject of vociferous and uncharitable attack. In a scathing and manifestly unfair critique of her writings on chastity and contraception, Bernard Williams, uh, who was a philosopher in, in his own right, and I think a very good philosopher, accused her of, quote, preaching the impoverishment of life. To which she replied the following, and this quote is on your handout. It's the last quote on your handout. This is an honest accusation. It is something they really think about what I really think. It is an old and intelligible accusation against the Christian religion, that one must be prepared to lose one's life to save it, that being poor in spirit is blessed, that what looks like deprivation and mutilation may be the path of life, the alternative death. All this Christianity has indeed taught. It is strange that ordinary chaste and faithful marriage should seem to exemplify this, but that's what our age is like. At this point in time, I look at that old accusation with rather wry feelings. For what, for example, is the state of the arts at the present? What the thought of the most serious and alive writing in theater? That we are all crawling about in shit, that all is hopeless and absurd. 
When I look back on the richness and solidity of what people were able to produce, when the impoverishing moral ideas that I think true were acknowledged, and then at the wretchedness of today, I feel mild surprise that anyone is angry with me for not much liking the spirit of the present age. Uh, this is a quote that I was thinking about um, given the recent fire in Paris, the richness and solidity of what people were able to produce when the impoverishing ideas were considered the truth. Okay, so while Anscombe was routinely attacked and dismissed by her contemporary colleagues for her defense of old-fashioned ideas like justice and chastity, it is important to note that she was sometimes at odds with her fellow Catholics and Christians over matters of truth. In a very famous debate with C.S. Lewis, Anscombe destroyed one of his central arguments for theism, the supposedly self-refuting character of naturalism. While some were dismayed that she would so ardently oppose a well-known apologist who was sincerely arguing for the existence of God, Anscombe simply saw herself as fulfilling a duty to expose poor reasoning. The truths of the faith will never contradict or oppose right reasoning, she thought. They will merely perfect it in light of its own natural limitations. Her daughter, Mary Geach, relates an interesting story about her mother with respect to this point. As an undergraduate, Anscombe encountered a passage by Bertrand Russell that argued that an argument from the facts about the world to the existence of God could not be valid, as one could never deduce a necessary conclusion from contingent premises. At the time, Anscombe was not able to see what was wrong with this claim. But she knew that it went against Catholic doctrine, so she went to a church and made an act of faith. After further careful reflection, she came to see the nature of Russell's error, that what he said was in fact false, and this could be clearly demonstrated. But it was only on account of her faith that she was led to pursue the matter, to find the reason. Without her faith, she might have taken Russell, the great philosopher, at his word. Anscombe's faith very often guided where she directed her attention in philosophy and to how she pursued the truth as a philosopher. So I have as a handout, um, Anscombe composed this little syllabus of errors uh, in 1986 titled 20 Opinions Common Among Modern Anglo-American Philosophers. Uh, you can look at what they are. And in this piece, she argued that many beliefs put forward by analytic philosophers were inimical to the Christian religion, such as that a human being is not necessarily a person, or that we are not members of a biological species, but selves, that there are no natural kinds or essences, and that ethics is formally independent of the facts of human life and autonomous, so that ethical considerations will be the same for any rational being. Now, if one looks at her corpus as a whole, one will find that she is very often attacking theses uh, on, this, on this interesting document. But she attacks them on strictly philosophical grounds and with arguments that any non-believer might reasonably accept. With her husband, Peter Geach, Anscombe had seven children. Strains credulity to think that she gave herself over to the creation and maintenance of a large family for personal gain or because she was simply smitten with the habits of domestic life. The demands that motherhood placed on her at a time when very few women worked outside the home, let alone had the demanding career of an internationally acclaimed academic, were obviously difficult and taxing. But Anscombe clearly believed that the Christian ideal of chastity revealed a deep truth about the human person, and she further believed that the practice of artificial methods of contraception were opposed to its cultivation and growth. These beliefs were at the time, and still are, deeply unpopular even among Roman Catholics, both lay and clerical. But again, Anscombe followed the truth where she believed it led her, she had a large family and didn't count the cost 
or as is so common now, constantly complain or remark about how draining it is. In addition to facing open contempt and scorn, Anscombe was willing to be arrested for her convictions and was not averse to public protest. She was arrested twice at abortion clinics and her advanced eggs, a age, and there are pictures online of her being carried off by police. Um, although her conservative fans tend to downplay her public opposition to World War II, Truman, the Vietnam War, and nuclear arms, her progressive fans are equally embarrassed by her commitments to the inviolable dignity or worth of each human person at every stage of human life and her traditional ideals of chastity. Certainly, it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to characterize her in terms of our ready-to-hand political categories. And I think that's a virtue. I think that's precisely because her thought and her reasoning did not bend itself to conform to the goals of any political party or agenda. And I think we could learn a lot from her in this respect, as I think this is quite common. Finally, although Anscombe was a devout and committed Catholic, many of her friends and closest collaborators, like Philip of Foot and Iris Murdoch, as well as many of her students, were not only not Catholic, but atheists who disagreed with her about matters of great consequence. What allowed Anscombe to enter into these relationships in a deep way, I think, was her desire to understand, a desire which led her into deep intellectual friendships with others who shared that same desire. And what her students and her friends admired and were attracted to in her was not simply her manifest brilliance, although she was manifestly brilliant, but her dogged and unflinching insistence upon the truth. For Anscombe, the pursuit of the truth involved engagement with error, and thus it is a mistake to surround oneself with people who happen to agree with you. Wittgenstein had taught Anscombe that you cannot go too carefully about a philosophical error. You do not know how much truth there may be in it. And Anscombe was often able to extract the kernel of truth from false philosophical theories she rejected. For instance, in her paper, The Intentionality of Sensation, Anscombe extracts the truth that the sense data theorist wishes to respect in his false theory, namely, that a perceiver can always answer a what question when asked to describe her perceptual experience, and the descriptions she gives in her answer to this question correspond to what is first personally and phenomenally appreciable about that experience. This is what leads sense datum theorists to posit actual sense data as the objects of perception. So while these truths led sense data theorists to the false idea that there are literal objects of sense data and thereby made themselves into objects of ridic ridicule and contempt, Anscombe thought it was a mistake to querulously dismiss them. The philosophical error was not to recognize these intuitive truths about perceptual experience, but to explain them by positing special sorts of objects. The error was a failure to understand the special nature of perceptual intentionality and the special sense of the question what and the grammatical use of object that any account of it must employ. To get to a true account, one has to reckon with the facts the wrong theory thematizes and to try to see them in a new light. Anscombe's own view of perceptual intentionality draws equally from Aquinas, Aristotle, and Frege, and it's radically non-empiricist. But she only came to it by taking a very extreme form of empiricism seriously. In this, she aimed to do philosophy as Wittgenstein had taught her, the bloody hard way. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna say about Anscombe generally. And now I wanna say something about practical truth. Um, and then I want there to be time for questions. Okay, so I've been talking about Anscombe's life and saying that it was marked by an obedience and a fidelity to the truth. 
Um, but I'm interested in thinking of it as a specifically practical kind of truth. Now, practical truth is not a concept deployed in contemporary philosophy. And since it's a concept that goes back to Aristotle, we might as well go back to what Aristotle says about it. And I have a long quote on your handout from the one passage that Aristotle talks about practical truth. It's in book six of the Nicomachean Ethics. It occurs in Aristotle's discussion of the virtues that perfect our intellectual powers. So the virtues that uh, perfect our power to know and understand. The attainment of truth, Aristotle notes, is the work or the job or the function of any intellectual capacity. It provides a measure of its success or failure. So a judgment is true, a belief is true, oh, sorry, yeah. A judgment is good as a judgment if it's true. It's bad as a judgment if it's false. Now, Aristotle marks a division in his metaphysics between cognition and desire, and onto this division, he grafts a separation between intellectual virtues, those that perfect our power to know, and moral virtues. Moral virtues are dispositions that perfect our powers to desire. Since knowledge and desire are the primary sources of action in human beings, these powers must be habituated properly in order for us to act well. So wisdom allows us to judge and reason well about the most important things and is primarily about grasping and applying principles correctly, while moral virtue allows us to realize what is judged well in our actions and is primarily about wanting things in accordance with reason's judgments. So it's about conformity of desire to the known truth. To live well requires both well-habituated intellect and well-habituated appetites, such that what one asserts, as a matter of fact, it is good to do, and what one pursues in action actually align. I think we all know from experience that sometimes what we judge we ought to do, we can't quite bring ourselves to do. So in the person who is well habituated, these things are going to align with one another. Now if these conditions are in place, Aristotle thinks we can speak of practical thinking and of the attainment of a truth that is practical. He calls it the truth corresponding to right desire. Um, so I guess what I want to point out here is that Aristotle does not think that knowledge is sufficient for action or acting well. So he rejects a kind of Socratic intellectualism. Um, and he thinks that um, in addition to right intellect or right judgment, we have to have right desire. Um, and one of the reasons why he's so insistent upon this is because in order to be virtuous, in order to live well, Aristotle doesn't think that it suffices that you do the right thing. You have to do the right thing, you have to do the right thing for the right reason or the right motive, but you also have to do it with ease and pleasure. So if you, like, you know, if you keep your promise, but like it's really hard for you, and it's like a real downer, and you hate it, and you wish that you weren't doing it, you're not living well. <laughs> um, a just man does what is just with ease and pleasure. Okay, um, now, if practical thought essentially aims at acting such that the proper conclusion of practical deliberation is acting, then practical judgment is the kind of judgment that terminates in an action. This is how Anscombe reads Aristotle in the first essay she wrote on practical truth in 1965. She writes that we can speak of practical truth when the judgments involved in the formation of the object of choice leading to the action are all true, they're true judgments. But the practical truth is not the truth of those judgments but is truth in agreement with right desire. So getting the correct judgment doesn't suffice. Um, Anscombe further writes that in acting, what is brought about or made true by action um, should be described in the case when you're acting well 
as executing a good choice. And if you do that, if you execute a good choice, that is to say you carry out what you intend and your choice was a good one, then you will have attained practical truth. Now, not every action will produce practical truth in this sense, perhaps most will not. So the actions of the wicked man or the weak-willed person or the just plain ignorant will produce practical falsehood. Of this, Anscombe writes, this is also a quote from your handout, the man who forms and executes an evil choice will also make true some descriptions of what he does. He then will have produced practical falsehood. So here's how I want to think about Anscombe on practical truth. Practical truth is fully secured by actions that can be truthfully described at the most general level of intentional descriptions as living well. So you can think of, I suppose that there are many descriptions of what I'm doing right now. I'm standing at a podium, I'm speaking words, I'm giving a talk, um, I'm pursuing wisdom. The most general level that you can give, the most general intentional description of any human act that you could possibly give is living well. And that's only true if I am, in fact, in giving this talk right now, living well, or if somehow I'm, I'm falling short of the mark. Although the barrier of practical truth is a judgment, because practical judgments are the formal causes of both choice and action, there is a sense in which Anscombe believes that practical truth can be applied directly to actions. Insofar as in acting, an agent makes true the descriptions under which she acts as indicative of her practical judgments and choice, all the way up again to the most general action description of living well. Okay, so I'd like to close by saying how practical truth relates to human happiness. So let us assume with Aristotle and Aquinas that virtue is necessary but not sufficient for human happiness. And let's take a picture of virtue according to which they perfect our human capacities such that we are able to rationally direct them towards the creation and maintenance of a good human life. The virtuous person is the one who possesses practical truth by living well. It is because he attains this truth that we rightly say he is the rule and measure of good human action. Such persons are exemplars for others who are trying to attain virtue, those who possess some modicum of practical truth but not the fullness of it. The fullness of practical truth requires both practical wisdom and moral virtue. I think we can see this more clearly by thinking about Aquinas on the cardinal virtues. These are prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude. Aquinas teaches that prudence secures the good of practical reason through right practical judgment. Justice executes or realizes this good in external actions. Fortitude protects it by training our fears so that we can hold fast to the truth in the face of difficult circumstances. And temperance safeguards the good of reason against sensual desires that draw us away from it. And I think when you consider uh, the unity of the virtues, you're really considering how all of our principal human powers operate for the sake of a single end. That is to say, living well or being happy. So my final point is how practical truth relates to truth unqualified. Practical truth depends on possessing the truth. That is, practical truth depends on having a correct grasp of reality. A good human life is in tune with reality. Most importantly, the reality of human nature and its characteristic activities and goods. To realize the good, and thus to make true the description living well of one's actions in the world, depends on possessing the truth of what sort of life a human should live, and that depends on possessing the truth about what a human being is. And I guess, um, I guess what I want to suggest is that when we look at Anscombe's life, 
we see someone who believed that living well really did require the conformity of the will to a vision of what is truth. That to love and to be obedient to the truth takes sacrifice and is often an occasion of real suffering. That living the truth can make you the subject of attack, arrest, and condemnation. It might destabilize your family ties. Anscombe knew this in a personal way. But Anscombe also found her joy in the truth, and that joy is an apt description of what genuine human happiness truly consists in. Thanks for your attention.